this is a talk on how researchers can make lie detection uh, more attractive to practitioners. Um, many, many researchers nowadays um, focus on verbal lie detection, but many practitioners are lagging behind. Um, and I think there are some reasons for that. And um, there are some concerns from practitioners who we speak to about uh, verbal lie detection. What we're going to do, what to do here is we'll say what kind of uh, concerns they have. Uh, it's not a, uh, I haven't done a survey, so that sense is rather subjective, but I will say. Um, what we need to do is to make verbal lie detection more attractive to, uh, to practitioners. When you sometimes speak to verbal uh, lie detection researchers, they say things like uh, verbal lie detection is more accurate than non-verbal lie detection. That's true. But it doesn't make it more attractive to practitioners because practitioners who use non-verbal line detection like it. And something like this, many of the problems do, you, uh, do not just apply to verbal line detection, they also apply to non-verbal line detection. Again, that's true. But it doesn't mean if you say that, that uh, practitioners are going to use uh, verbal line detection. You have to be more uh, creative. And that's what we're trying to do, at least in this talk. Um, there are concern one, I think, is, is, is the main concern. That is that all these interview styles that have been developed so far are not suited for verbal lie detection. There are four now, as far as I know, the four now developed, the SU, the VA, CCA, and that's it. I have no time to uh, discuss them all, but if you know about verbal detection, you will know them. Um, they all have... Um, one thing in, in, in common, that is what you need, you need a, a, a free recall without any interruption. And then based on that, you can do these analyses. That is not what's happening in real life. In real life, uh, there's hardly any free recall. And usually you get many uh, questions to which short answers can be given. There's some reasons for that. Uh, some interview protocols are developed like that, designed like that because there's no time. The 9-11 interviews uh, is an example of that. Um, some interviews are reluctant to talk, and that means the practitioners are going to ask more and more questions. And sometimes interviewers are just very eager to ask questions. Um, what can we do to that? Um, well, we can see and, and try where existing uh, protocols could be used in those, in those interview protocols they usually use, practitioners usually use. Um, I am uh, pessimistic about that. Uh, I've seen quite a few of those interviews of practitioners who asked me to have a look and see how we can use verbal lie detection in their, in their interviews. And I always uh, realize it doesn't look really uh, possible in the way they interview. So what we could do or should do maybe is to design entirely new uh, interview protocols for us, the assessment tools that now uh, will fit better with what they do. That's a big challenge. Um, Concern number two is what we are, what most people are looking for is something like total details, the total amount of information. And uh, that's a very popular cue in verbal lie detection. It's completely and entirely unsuitable for lie detection purposes. Um, it is an important cue because it tells you a lot about information gathering. And of course, the, the main aim of an interview is to get information. And total information, that cue, total details give you that. But for lie detection, it is not, not good. Why not? For two reasons. Um, it cannot be measured in real life time. Typically, what you do is you either transcribe an interview and then count the number of details, or you do that automatically via software. But that's not happening in real life interviews. They are just is interviewing somebody, an interviewer is, asked, is interviewing an interviewee, and then have to count those details in real li life time. He will not be able to do that. The second reason even maybe more important, it is so vulnerable to countermeasures. If only a suspect will get to know, well, what they need to do is just to give information in order to sound uh, convincing. That, of course, makes it extremely vulnerable to countermeasures. Uh, somebody who likes total details of variable will then say, now, of course, they will not work like that. Because, of course, the interviewer will then listen to the type of details that somebody gives. But that is in, 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 uh, not anymore the total details variable. Um, so what's the solution to that? You need to focus on alternative cues that can be uh, counted in real lifetime. And there are three uh, present so far. Complications is one of them. Uh, clusters of details that make a story more complex. 
I initially didn't see him was waiting at a different entrance, those kind of things. That's, they are more uh, uh, likely to occur in truthful stories and people can count them in real lifetime. Verifiable sources, that's related to the verifiability approach. Uh, named witnesses, CCTV uh, footage, receipts, digital traces. When uh, uh, suspects refer to those things you can check, verifiable sources, they are more likely to, to occur in truthful stories and indeed we can count them in real life. Or look at plausibility. How likely is it that activities happened in the way they, uh, they are described? Plausibility is also something that can be judged in real lifetime. So the three cues that can be judged in real lifetime, we also know that all three of them are, are more difficult uh, for liars to, um, to imitate when they try to use countermeasures. Um, the third problem is this. Um, we shouldn't not only examine cues of truthfulness, but also cues to deceit. Uh, cues to deceit are cues that uh, line tellers display more frequently than, than truth tellers. For example, uh, inconsistencies between statement and evidence. That's a cue to deceit. Cues of truthfulness are cues that truth tellers display more frequently than line tellers. Complications, verifiable sources, plausibility, these are all cues of truthfulness. Uh, most verbal cues to deceit uh, are cues of truthfulness. But practitioners prefer to examine cues to deceit because that is direct evidence. If you want to prove that somebody's lying, it's far more and more, more obvious to look for a cue to deceit. Because if you now look for uh, the absence of cues of truthfulness, that's a very indirect way of trying to, uh, to detect a lie. So what we need to do as researchers is focus far more than we, knew, than we now do on those cues to deceit. Um, there are now uh, two, at least we examine two, that have some kind of uh, uh, diagnosticity although not as good as complications. Uh, common knowledge details, stereotypical information about events that uh, um, you can give without having experienced that. For example, this in the Louvre Museum in Paris, we saw the Mona Lisa. I think most people will know that Paris, that's a Louvre Museum there, and it's widely known the Mona Lisa is there. So you can say that without having been to Paris at all. Uh, self handicapping strategies are justifications as to why somebody chooses not to provide information. Uh, liars uh, uh, are inclined not to give too much information for several reasons, but they're inclined to do that. Uh, but I also think that sounds suspicious. And one way now of getting out of that is, is to give yourself a good justification as to why you can't give information. And that's called the self handicapping strategy. Uh, this is an example uh, that's probably more relevant for the UK audience than anything else, but this is uh, uh, Dominique Cummins, who was a uh, advisor uh, of Boris Johnson, who's our present uh, prime minister. And they both had COVID at a certain time last year. And during the time of having COVID, uh, Cummings drove with his wife and child from London during lockdown to the North of England. That was completely illegal. He did that. Uh, was supported, by the way, by Johnson for doing that, interviewed about that, uh, why he did that. And one of the questions was, um, did you discuss this with Johnson, the fact that you drove to, uh, to the north of England? The answer was, yes, uh, we discussed that. And then the question was, what did you discuss? And this is what he said. When we were both sick and in bed with COVID, I mentioned to him what I had done. Unsurprisingly, given the condition we were in, Neither of us remember the conversation in any detail. That's a self handicapping strategy, not only for himself, but now also for Johnson. I'm absolutely convinced that Cummings knows what he discussed, but doesn't want to tell us that. Uh, concern number four is that cutoff points do not exist. Uh, occurrence of cues not only depends on the veracity, but also on personality and on the situation. Some people will give you more information, more details than others. And some situations are more, more uh, uh, include more details than others, are, are, more, more, are more richer in details than others. Um, and if that's the case, what you therefore can't do is just say, okay, there's so many complications present, it must be true or not, because it really depends on the person and on the situation. How do you get uh, around that? You get around that by using a verbal baselining. Verbal baselining, is, uh, has two parts. First is control for individual differences. That means what you need to do is to compare different parts of a statement within the same person. 
So different parts of a statement uh, uh, made by the same person. That is what typically happens in baselining. Also, even in non-verbal baselining, if you read police manuals, they do that very well. They always control for uh, uh, individual differences. But you need to do more. You also need to control for situational differences. That is that in different situations, also you get differences in, in, in complications and so forth. You need to co uh, control for that as well. And how do you do that? You do that by comparing different parts of the statement in which the person discusses exactly the same event. That's never happening. It's not happen happening in non-verbal uh, baselining. It's not happening either in studies about verbal baselining. So in all these studies, you have the same person uh, um, describing two different events. And then you're looking for difference or, 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 uh, or similarities. That's not good enough. You need to control for individuals, but also for the situation. So you need to let the same person talk about exactly the same event. That is adequate verbal baselining. Um, we started doing that in our approach. And how do we do that? Uh, we use the initial free recall just as baseline. So based on the initial free recall, tell me all you remember that question. We don't make any judgments yet, but that is the baseline. And then we move on by asking interviewees to recall the event again, but now in different formats. For example, we say, okay, that was the first recall. What we now want you to do is listen to this, this model statement, which is a very detailed uh, account of a, um, a topic unrelated to the topic of the investigation. And then say, listen to that. And after that, please now recall the information again. And that uh, nearly always leads to more information. We're looking now for the additional information the interviewees gave after the model statement. And it results, we know that from research in more uh, complications by truth tellers and liars and more information about the core event more than liars do. Uh, you can do other things. You can ask the second time, tell now the story in reverse order. So start at the end, go back to the beginning. We know that that leads to more additional information by truth tellers. Uh, truth tellers try to reconstruct the event. So go back to the memory and then think about the event again. And that nearly always leads to new information. Liars uh, do far more repetitions. Liars often think this kind of a trick. He wants to see, but I can tell the story in reverse order that I just told in normal order. So they try to repeat themselves and that very often does not lead to new information. Or you can uh, use sketches. Uh, let people sketch when they also uh, give the narrative. Uh, that leads more in truth tellers and liars in new information. Several reasons for that. One reason is sketching will uh, slow down the thinking process. Because when you sketch, uh, you also, the time you sketch, you now also think about the event. And the more you think about the event, at least for truth tellers, the more information they can give about that event. Uh, finally, this concern number five is this. Uh, people from different cultures may show different verbal cues to the seat. And we know that. We know indeed what cultural research has shown uh, that there are some cues are, are uh, uh, diagnostic in some cultures and not in others. We even know that some cues are, are diagnostic for truthfulness in some cultures, but for deceit in other cultures. That, of course, makes lie uh, uh, detection extremely difficult. Uh, what is the, 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 the solution to that? Try, try to focus on cues that are culturally independent. Line detection is already difficult enough for, for investigators. If you can also go to say to them, though, in this culture, you need to think about that. In that culture, you need to think about something else. It becomes, in our view, far too difficult. So focus on cues that are really the cues to the seat or truthfulness in, 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 in different cultures. And that's what we've done. So complications are cues to truthfulness in the UK, in the US, at least that's why I have examined that, in Russia, in South Korea, in Lebanon, and Mexico. These are countries we've done it uh, so far. And indeed, the, 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 the information we have now about Russia, where we've done studies for about five, six years, can be very informative for, uh, for, well, for the near future. Uh, so what should researchers do? Um, Above all, look for verbal veracity assessment tools that can be applied in interviews that consist of many questions and short answers. That is what the practitioners mostly do, and as research in that area is absolutely absent. Uh, verbal cues try to, to focus on those that can be estimated in real lifetime and are not vulnerable to countermeasures. Uh, verbal cues to the seat need to be uh, examined rather than just the truthfulness. 
and trying to focus on cues that occur independently from cultural background of the interviewee. Uh, this talk is now uh, in press in psychiatry, psychology, and law. It's only just in press. I got the the, the doing number, but I haven't got uh, the article yet. But it, I think soon the PDF will be there. That was that was it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>